Love it. We love to hear it. Um, and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Carmen. My pronouns are she, her. I am the editorial director here at Jane. Also, if you are with us as part of the New Year New Jane Summit, it is so lovely to see you here. I'm also the producer of the summit. And if you are not attending the summit, I highly advise you to buy your tickets right after this talk. It's going to be amazing. Um, and I would also like to start our conversation by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I am on in Los Angeles, the Tongva tribe and their elders past and present. And as we gather in a connected community online, I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands of North, Central, and South America, the indigenous peoples and their elders past and present. We also acknowledge here at Jane that this naming is not enough for the justice that we seek to realize for indigenous folks. Along with this acknowledgement, we ask what responsibilities and commitments can we make to foster more honest and generative relations with this land and with each other? And can we, wherever we go, acknowledge indigenous claims to the land that we occupy? I also wanna name that today my highest intention is that our words and language do not cause harm to each other and to those joining. I'll also be holding that intention throughout the conversation and will stand in the feedback if I fall short. If part of today's program becomes interactive, feel free to decline to participate. Be as involved as your comfort level, time, and attention allow. No is a complete sentence. I'm also recording this session to share internally for Jane On Demand, but I ask that no one else records and that it is only viewed internally. There will be time for Q&A at the end, so feel free to ask questions in the chat. And on that note, so much of what we talk about here at Jane is honoring the work of women, the paid and unpaid labor that women do, how undervalued our time is, how much space we hold in our lives and taking time right now to share her time with us is no small feat. So I'm honored that Marie Tessier is here. Marie is a journalist and writer who moderates comments to the opinion pages of the New York Times. Her work has appeared on the Women's E! News and Women's Media Center websites in Ms. Magazine, the Columbia Journalism Review, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune and elsewhere. And she is the author of Digital Suffragists, Women, the Web, and the Future of Democracy, which was so amazing that I left all of these notes in it and also oh. like could not put it down, just started reading it and was like, I have to keep going. I have to finish it. It was so good. And so thank you so much, Marie, for writing it and for being here with us today. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here. And, uh, you know, I always like to start with an inception story. And so I'm just so curious as to how after you know a lifetime online you finally came to write this book you know you mentioned that you're thinking about comment culture and digital space kind of grew out of your shock at underrepresentation of women in the comments at the times but i'm curious like was there sort of that that click moment you know that moment that really pushed you into doing the research and connecting all of the dots um, that would create this guide to how we might transform our digital world uh, I wouldn't say there's any one moment. I mean, really, in a way, it's my whole life, right? Uh, the only girl in my family. Uh, I was really at the cusp of a lot of major uh, transitions in uh, national life. Um, and when I started working at the Times, it was the year before uh, the iPhone came out. So, you know, Barack Obama was not yet president. Um, being online, I had just gotten high-speed internet. Uh, I live in Maine, so high-speed internet wasn't really a thing uh, as soon as it might have been in, in Los Angeles. Um, and I got hired to moderate comments. And they asked me, where would you like to, you know, what topics would you like to cover? And I said, oh, give me opinion. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And uh, we have a lot of really the most thoughtful comments on the internet. We try to say that it's the best conversation on the web. And I really believe that. And I couldn't keep doing it if I didn't believe it. But I'm moderating the comments in the early stages of comments on the New York Times. And there just weren't women speaking up. Now, I know that, you know, I was an econ major in college. And I know that women aren't really comfortable around, uh, you know, the math, more mathematical aspects of econ, uh, but women do finance. There's women, journalists are involved in financial news in a huge way. Uh, 
but they didn't have anything to say on Paul Krugman's column. And uh, when, but when Gail Collins had a column, she, people, women would join in. And I was like, what's up with this? Because, you know, this, there was no space, you know, it wasn't like a women and men section, you know, this is the difference. And I couldn't, I wanted an explanation. And so I started counting who was com contributing comments and it came across as kind of 20% to 25% on the, um, the wider opinion section at that time. It's now like ancient history, right? Um, and it was coming out to like 20 to 30% of the comments. And I thought, well, that's weird. That's the same proportion as we have women in Congress. Uh, oh my word, that's the same, about the same proportion as we have uh, women on television, in, in television news. And, you know, all these markers start lining up. And I thought, well, that's weird. And uh, I applied for a fellowship to really look deeply into it. And uh, my alma mater, the University of Missouri School of Journalism, gave me a, a nine month fellowship to look at it while I was continuing to do my work at the Times. And sure enough, by the time I got done with that fellowship, I realized that women's participation in the comments really does reflect the level of women's leadership and prominence in the world in general. Um, one thing that um, people in politics have known about before, clearly it's also true in uh, public schools and universities, women, there are certain, um, atmosphere, certain environments when, where women are happy to speak up. And we see that these different fields develop, like uh, biology and medicine. Women are fully represented in those fields, by and large, um, but not in computer science or physics or chemistry. So these cultures develop, um, and I just really want to intervene in the online culture and make things better so that you know, civic conversations will reflect women's concerns and issues. Right. And I mean, you know, the numbers totally shocked me and, and not, not necessarily the underrepresentation of women that shocked me. What shocked me more was the overrepresentation of everyone else. Like I, you know, that you include studies about how half of people have left comments on, on news sites and, and social media, that three quarters of people are reading them. And of course, then that 30% or less pretty much across the board and all these different studies show that are coming from women. Um, and that so often when comments do come from women, as we all could predict, spoiler alert, they are targeted for harassment. Um, and often, you know, that act of speaking up makes them into a target. And I went into this book thinking, um, like one of the authors you referenced, that comments were, no offense, the bottom of the internet, sort of, you know, this lost cause. I mean, for me, um, you know, I... I always felt like comment culture was sort of already declining by the time I started becoming a writer online. I had like the one website where our comments were so loving and generous and kind. And then sort of everywhere else was that era in the you know 2010s of people really saying, we're cutting the comment section, right? Like this just isn't a feature on our website anymore. And so you see these spaces as this public, this new public square. And I would love if you could talk a little more to like, why it is that women's voices are so critical in these spaces and sort of what we all lose when we are pushed out of them or we resign ourselves to not engaging with them. Uh, well, my entire professional purpose, the whole reason why I do this is because I believe in democracy and civic participation. And if women aren't speaking up, if they're, we don't have spaces where that are created, that are designed to include everyone's voices, then we don't have a democratic forum. We have something else. And if you talk to uh, black scholars of internet culture, you know, when they talk about news sites in per se, they said, well, black people don't participate there because it's a white space, you know? And there, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's just an objective fact. But that is not newspapers' identity of them, their own selves. And so they don't realize 
how closed the environment can actually be. So, but I think a lot of people would have a very difficult time identifying news comments as a, as a man's space. We just wouldn't say that. And I think that's the first thing we have to call it out, which is a little bit of what I'm trying to do. But second of all, talk about redesigning and creating an environment and a culture um, where it can happen. And I, I think there are ways, I mean, we've had all kinds of other, you know, if we can have facial recognition, we can have troll recognition. Yes. And, um, you know, onward. I love that. And, you know, I, I loved your, you know, you included here this, the sort of mythological utopia that people thought the internet was going to be. And I think about this all the time, because when I, you know, I feel like we got the internet in my house in 2003 and I have spent like my entire, you know, all the, all of the work that I've done has been feminist work on the internet, like almost exclusively since, you know, since it was possible for me to do that. And I also was like, the internet is, you know, suddenly everything will disappear. This idea that we didn't actually have to do any work to fix these imbalances that existed in physical space. The internet would fix them for us because it was democratic and there was this equitable access and these little, very little barriers to being able to participate. Um, and of course, that is not what happened on the internet. And, um, you know, it did democratize discourse in some ways, but it comes at such a high cost. And I'm curious, you know, when you talk about this new internet culture, what do you think that like a less masculine and, you know, what does an internet look like? What does a digital culture look like that doesn't assume that the person who's gonna be interested in engaging in discourse is a white dude who, you know, is commenting on the New York Times.com? Like, what does that different culture look like? Well, the first thing to understand is that back like 40 years ago, when the internet, you know, when Al Gore's internet uh, was developing from the, you know, was really crossing the line from the defense department and from the sciences, the hard sciences and engineering into everyday life, into all of our homes as we are, um, the people who were designing those spaces were guys. So they designed a space, oh cool, we can make it work so people can add their voices, right? It was very linear, you know, one voice followed another. And it turns out that that was really an environment designed for people who like to sound off. Mm. And when I speak of gender, I'm pretty sure that the Janes have this down, but uh, I am not a gender essentialist, but you know, gender being a, you know, two overlapping bell curves. So there's always gonna be guys who don't wanna speak up and there's always gonna be some women who are gonna be the loud mouth and there's gonna be, uh, but there's gonna be a bigger portion of women who are uncomfortable with the natural kinds of conflict culture that grew up as really male-centered communities. Um, the, uh, something else that a lot of people don't understand, uh, I think we understand more about how language works because of some of the computer work that's been done with natural language processing and so forth. But gender exists in online communities. And even when people use screen names, something like 85 or 90% of the language that's used in, in all screen name environments um, it's the language used is identifiably gendered. So the idea that anonymity was going to solve problems, mm -hmm. it just was completely mistaken. And we shouldn't overlook that, the power of that. Totally. And, you know, I think um, something that was fascinating that I would love to dig into too is this idea, like you said, that not only is digital culture sort of it's inception story is that it's built by dudes, right? But then also there's this very masculine and, you know, tied up in capitalism way that tech and startup culture envision how you create a product, right? Which is iteration and this idea that, you know, we're going to get it out there and it's not going to be perfect and we're going to fix it as we go along. But the problem, as you identify in this book, is like that a lot of times those issues that they don't identify at the beginning are things that very uniquely impact 
women, people of color, marginalized folks and make them feel unwelcome or unsafe. Um, and so, you know, I think that that is really fascinating, this idea that in order to almost fix digital culture and disentangle things, like what are some of those larger, beyond patriarchy, what are some of those like larger structures that we really have to rethink in order to make this new internet culture possible? Well, if you think about uh, design thinking, for example, you know, you have this ideation and building and reassessment and feedback loops all the way through. The fact is there are plenty of gender informed tools to create and, and embed diversity, equity, and inclusion into every aspect of that creation cycle. So all of the lean agile technology uh, development structures all they really need to do, it's not even hard, is integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion principles into what they're doing. And the second thing they need to do is actually be sensitive to what people are saying about their community. So when I read some of the original um, design thinking documents, it's about how the designer has to have empathy with the community that they're designing for. And the problem is not all of the people who have the power to design things actually have empathy for the communities they're designing for. So now there are new methods to incorporate community engagement with design process. And, um, you know, there's a million ways that all of those processes can be, you know, canceled basically. So one of the, um, comment spaces, one of the conversation spaces that actually is very inclusive of women is Facebook. And one of the reasons, there are a few spaces, a few reasons for that, of course, Mark Zuckerberg created and his colleagues created Facebook as a place for people to talk to each other. And it's about making community connections. And that's the primary motivation for women is to have a conversation. One of the beauties of Facebook is you can choose who you talk to. That's not true on an open web right. space. Um, at the New York Times, we kind of decide who you talk to, right? Or whoever's reading the story, they, they'll see your comments. But it, we don't protect you from seeing somebody else's comments and so forth. But we try to keep out, um, you know, the real, we, we keep out the nasty comments. Um, so all of the technology and all of the design principles exist in the tools to make it better right now. It's just about really um, spreading those principles and, and tools around and using them sincerely. Uh, well, I was gonna, so I, I'm sorry, I, I missed a point about Facebook. So Facebook is really designed for people to communicate with each other, to have conversations, to talk who you want to talk to who you want to, um, and know you, you can control who's seeing your comments. But, you know, they've also created this uh, monster, right. you know, with the algorithm. So they're, they're rewarding conflict, which makes a general conversation, a general civic conversation completely unpalatable to anyone except the most conflict-oriented people. So, um, you know, hate wins on the on Facebook a lot of times. Um, so, and we, you know, we all know the terrible impact that that's had. But um, in essence, they have the they have the capacity to do better, and I think they can. Right, and I mean, it also seems like obviously, like with most things, it's not that there's not an answer or a solution to, right? Like these outgrowths um, and platforms uh, rewarding and allowing, you know, misogyny and racism and all of that ugly stuff to happen. It's really almost always, it's like, like you said, empathy and taking what's happening seriously. And there was this, I mean, like so much in this book was like an aha, oh my God, you know, like someone finally putting language to, uh, experiences that I've had and witnessed uh, while I've been doing this work in the internet for over 10 years. And one of them was this concept of you talk about, you know, 
using the domestic violence wheel as a form of now updating it and creating a version that measures abuse on the internet. And I think that what that almost like, I don't want to say it triggered me because it was like a good realization of like melting away these experiences that I had had. And you talk about this in the book too, like women will say, you know, I'm being endlessly harassed and tortured by trolls and strangers on the internet. And the, uh, the solution always seems to be leave the internet. Like oh, it's toxic, like delete, delete Twitter, you know, delete Instagram. And I mean, for some of us, that's not a choice, like financially, right? Like for some of us, for women in media, for people who work in tech, for a lot of different reasons, that's not always an actual option. But then also it's like, that feels it feels like that's equivalent to telling someone to like walk off the, just stop existing and then the harassment will stop. And it made me think a lot about, you know, I was targeted twice by harassment campaigns on the internet. And one was sort of led by a right-wing website. And one was led by a whole host of websites that were straight up. I mean, and people act like it's happening only on the internet, but it wasn't, it was threats being faxed to my office and people knew where I worked and they knew where my office was located and they were really angry at me and it was scary. And the response I got from all of my friends, even if they were being loving and supportive was like, you really shouldn't have tweeted. And this is what you get for wanting to have a platform on the internet. And when I read this section that you have about diagnosing it as a form of violence against women, it honestly felt like this watershed moment of me being able to say, that was a form of trauma. Witnessing this happen to women is a form of trauma. Having it happen to you is a form of trauma. And knowing it, it could happen. Yes, is a form of trauma. And it does. I mean, it was literally like reading your book. I was like, and that was the moment, you know, like that harassment, the second one where it got real serious and it was real big. That was the one where I was like, well, I guess I'm not off the cuff tweeted. Like, I guess the internet just doesn't have enough room anymore for me to, you know, not think critically about every single thing that I'm posting to make sure that it's perfect and no one's going to be mad at me and all that stuff. And it is a form of silencing. And so I'm curious if you could dig into, you know, sort of what power there is in naming and acknowledging these kinds of behaviors accurately and adequately and giving them the weight that they deserve and how that would like that seems like it would be such a critical step here well i think that the aspect of mob attacks uh i just want to say that i think we really need to conceive of those much more like physical attacks mm -hmm. and i think that the law enforcement community needs to be doing a lot more i mean threats criminal threats are against the law and there have been untold numbers of women. Brianna Wu is one of the most mm -hmm. documented cases. And she found out who her harasser was, who was the guy making the criminal threats. And the FBI went to go talk to the guy. And uh, he said, oh, well, I didn't think it was serious. And so they never charged him with anything. And this was like multiple years right. of, of uh, criminal threats. And people need to be made to understand that it's just the same as, you know, a mob attack. If you're in your car and 25 people surround it and start pounding on your car windows and stuff, it's just as threatening, uh, maybe even more, because if you can make it from your car to your house, you're probably safe. But if you're in your house and you're getting those threats over your computer or on your phone, you can never be safe. Right because that those kind of threats follow you. So um, there and there are real barriers to uh, law enforcement holding people responsible. One problem, of course, is that they just don't think it's that serious, uh, like with the Brianna Wu case. Um, but another problem is it has to be an imminent threat. And that is much harder to to demonstrate. So if, so if, if you feel threatened, it has to be the same that an average person would feel threatened. And again, with the law enforcement folks, they don't often understand that how much more threatening, how much more realistic it is for women to fear a rape threat because women are like 10, 20 times more likely to be raped. 
Right. So, and um, we have a lot, not, not only are we more likely, it's, it's a realistic threat for us. And, you know, the average police officer, maybe not, although uh, victims of sexual assault are overrepresented in the military and in police work. Um, so, but there are going to have to be some changes in the law. It's not, you know, it is very difficult to bring a case because it's difficult to prove uh, an imminent threat. And that's a legal standard that the courts created, not that statutes have anything to do with. Um, I want to share this. So this is an image. Um, I don't know if any of you have done work on uh, domestic violence, but many moons ago, uh, a domestic violence project in Minnesota developed something called the uh, power and control wheel. And everybody's squinting at this. And I'll just, uh, I'm going to put it down because you can't, you can't read it. I'm going to try to find it so I can put it in the chat. Yeah, but the idea is that the online abuse is in the middle. And this is, this is your life and the things that make it worth living. Safety, security, financial um, security, uh, emotional harm, uh, your reputation. Uh, your professional life. Um, so the online, uh, the online abuse is in the middle. And then those spokes uh, include are different aspects of online abuse. It can include revenge porn. It can view uh, gender bullying, interpersonal porn, uh, grooming people online, uh, mob attacks, rape and death threats, doxing. So if someone, uh, you know, did you get docs, Carmen, when you when people knew where you lived? No, thank God. Uh, but I mean, you are touching on this idea that like, you know, it wasn't just people mad, mad at me on Twitter. It's like they knew where I worked and they were contacting my workplace. And, you know, they, that's where they were targeting me. It was like our fax machines and stuff, not mine, obviously. Right. <laughs> I do not have a fax machine just to set the record straight. Yeah. Um, and various kinds of stalking. I mean, cell phones are a genius way to stalk people. I mean, we're walking around with a GPS in our pockets, you know, 24 hours a day. I mean, I try and take them out of your jammies, but it's, the phone's still right there where you are. Um, so all of those things, we have to think about all of those kinds of threats and dangers as kind of a, a penumbra, you know, like a whole variety of things. And you can't just say it's because of criminal threats or uh, interpersonal porn or revenge porn. Um, never, not every one of those things is going to affect every person, but all of those things are manifestations of misogyny per se, and they, they make the internet a uniquely unsafe place for women. And um, it's really helpful, as you said, to think about online harassment in this way, because it, it's not any one thing. You know, if your abuser parks his car next to you, that's not terrifying. But when he shows up at your workplace every day after you broke up with him, that's terrifying. You know, there's a there's a time at which that becomes terrifying. And it's on purpose. And that has to be fixed. Yeah. And I mean, I think something that's also really powerful, and this is only one way in which you do this in the book is you really show that, you know, I think so often when we talk about the harassment that's happening on social media platforms, on websites, it, often it almost feels like the inverse of product of our time, this idea that, well, how are we supposed to know how to deal with this? This is new terrain, you know, that we've only been around for, I guess now it's really not even fair to say that they're young because these platforms have been around for so long, but they're, they always sort of are leaning on this idea of like, we're figuring out how to deal with this because it's just so unprecedented that this would occur. But you really show through these examples where you connect the dots between what's happening online right now and what's happening offline right now, but also historically how women have been silenced and marginalized in the public square and in, in you know, their private lives. And it reminded me a lot of, um, you know, when, when I first started checking out like suffrage memorabilia, seeing these anti-suffrage ads and postcards that were literally like pictures of, of women like getting their tongues cut off. Like that was how mad, that men were, that women dared to say they wanted to vote. You know, suffragists used to get beat up when they protested and attacked by people physically. Um, and 
So it, it makes me wonder too, you know, if, if the harassment and the abuse are unfortunately not new, if this is unfortunately, as you say, the product of millennia of social conditioning and gender myths, um, it also makes me think, you know, that our foremothers lived through this. They lived through this backlash. They lived through this attempt to silence them. And so I'm curious, you know, like what, what can we learn from them to cope with this current moment? What case studies or anecdotes sort of endure for you that you encountered when you were doing this research um, that seemed powerful for right now? Well, I think the, the biggest thing to remember, well, does anybody here know when uh, women in the United States first voted in the same proportion as men? Pop quiz. It was in 1980 when Ronald Reagan won the White House. So it took 60 years from the time that women got the right to vote under the constitution until they voted in the same proportion as men because it just wasn't seen as women's place. And the whole idea that people were raised with was that you know, it was a family vote or, you know, it was his job as king of the castle to do the voting. And um, it's the same issue. We have been so, uh, what do you call that? We've been so nurtured not to speak up. And we've been told in so many ways that our voices aren't wanted. Um, I mean, starting in high school, and certainly it happens in every workplace, we now have the word for man interruption. And there's also scholarship um, from Princeton and Brigham and Young University uh, from the middle 2010s that they did a comprehensive study of with uh, experimental groups of five member groups and they had them decide public policy questions. And they took that data and it found, they found out that the only time that women spoke in equal proportion to men in that five person group setting was either when women had a super majority or if a woman was chairing or facilitating the conversation. And they took that data and they ran it next to school boards, which is an area where women are pretty well represented. They're as well represented on school boards as they are um, in any public body. And the results of when were women speaking in those public meetings was exactly the same as those experimental groups, exactly the same. And so it was a perfect fit test that they did. And uh, the primary way that women's voices were cut off was through interruptions. So we just have to be claiming a lot more speaking time in every every forum that we have. Yeah, and I mean, you, you're you very clear, you know, uh, towards the end of the book that despite, it's almost like despite it all, you know, this is a long game, obviously. I mean, we are here on the internet fighting the same fight as our foremothers, right? And, and that we may not really see progress for generations. You do outline, you know, some successful strategies and programs that might get us there. I'm just curious, you know, what would be your advice to encouragement to folks who are rightly fearful um, of speaking up? You know, what are some of the ways that we can take up more space um, without necessarily having to resign ourselves to these embattled spaces? Yeah, I, I don't really recommend that anyone go on Twitter. I mean, you know, my publicist was no, 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 no. saying that. <laughs> I guess it's an important thing for uh, in the book world, but it's just a toxic environment, you know? Uh, you know, if Lindy West can't be on Twitter, I don't know why I should go. So I don't think we have to go into the most toxic areas and, and try, try to pretend that we can have a great conversation. Um, but I do have, I do think that there's a, um, you know, we should, we should all have a goal, a principle of equal participation in civic spaces. 
and, and national conversations and local conversations. Um, I mean, we talk about the percentage of women holding office. Um, but we have sort of never focused in on this, how much of a voice do women have, generally speaking? And I think we need to start talking about that a whole lot. I think, um, I think a lot of women would benefit, or I think uh, our culture would benefit if women really assessed why they were or were not speaking up. Because uh, I know that my particular concern, I was, I was dealing with, a, I was talking with a, a job coach and he said, well, why do you think, you know, why are you discounting yourself? And I said, look, I know what I had to say. You know, I am fine. What I'm concerned about is not being taken seriously. And that's a completely different thing. And it turns out that that's actually very typical. And it's because people don't often care what we have to say. I mean, that's, we're told that. So um, I think we should, all keep in mind the goal of equal participation and think of it as uh, as a democratic goal. I mean, just like every vote matters, every voice does matter. Um, so there's this entire layer of participation throughout society, and it you know it. I know I've experienced it in social situations, you know, in uh, professional situations, uh, and I really that's what I really want to shine a light on, and I think. If we think about it, if we reframe it as, oh, this isn't worth it to, boy, if I'm holding back my voice, I'm not really being a full participant. So I think it's just a matter of reframing what we think we're doing with our voices. That's my, that's my encouragement. I love that. And, and you know, um, you like you do show some of these solutions. And so I'm curious, like, what are some of the like the tools, the solutions, the the different ways of doing, you know, this building out of the digital space that you are most excited about or see as the most critical and how can, you know, all of us sort of help advance them or, sh you know, help make them more common? I think in the workplace, I think the idea, the real idea is to find ways, take leadership in integrating uh, an institution's diversity, equity, and inclusion goals into whatever it is that you're doing, and in particular, into the technology um, departments. That's, it's kind of an uphill climb uh, if, if you have a male-dominated uh, technology workforce, which many people do, uh, but that is really the key right there, is integrating the DEI goals into your agile lean operation, into your uh, engineering operations. How do you reframe everything and it means doing user experience research and not pretending that your perceived empathy is enough. Really test it. Totally. It's actually pretty, I mean, I don't think it, the, the answer is both, um, you know, short. It's a short answer. You know, integrate the DEI goals, period. Uh, <laughs> but the, there is in software, there is a new um, growing uh, set of tools available called Gender Mag, and it's a cognitive walkthrough tool for computer scientists, and it it's research based user experience uh, personas that can really, really improve what you're doing. Awesome, and something else that I find really interesting about all of these conversations is that women are the internet. I mean. And you touch on this over and over again, you know, women are, it is necessary for women to feel safe and welcome in digital spaces if newspapers want to survive, if social media platforms want to survive. And we make up, you know, this large share often of users, readers, um, or we make up a group of people that people are actively like, we need to get more users and readers who are women in order to, you know, be financially sustainable, culturally sustainable. And so I'm, I'm curious, especially because you have sort of this, this almost dual participation here, like seeing media from behind the scenes, and then also, you know, having been a writer and stuff yourself, what are, what power do we all hold? And how can we how can we best wield it, you know, in these spaces? 
Are you mean on the live on a live site? Yeah, or, like you know, or, like it feels so often like you know we're here talking about how the one thing that needs to happen is people taking this seriously. How can you know what power do women have as consumers as users that we can use to make people take I, this seriously? I think that the role that consumers and users can really take is insisting on um, you know proper civility in online spaces. Period. I mean, that is really what it's all about. And it's what, if you're gonna have, if you're gonna offer a forum, you need to make it a non-abusive forum that you just do. Um, so I think not, not just speaking up, but insisting on civil spaces and spaces, uh, you know, finding out. If, if your local newspaper has a comment section and there aren't very many women in it, and if you have a, an unmoderated space, you don't have very many women in it, you just don't, um, you know, people need to make sure that it happens, that, that having a better quality conversation, um, you know, it's guaranteed. Totally. And um, I have a few more questions for Maria, but if if you all have questions, feel free to start dropping them in the chat and I will make sure to start working them in as well. Uh, and, you know, sort of on this vein of what can we all do? Who can we be listening to? I literally like screamed and took a photo when you're in your book, you quote Yvonne Hutchinson twice. She is speaking at New Year New Jane this weekend about, you know, how to have hard conversations. Her new book is how to talk to your boss about race. And so I thought it was just incredible that, you know, she has written this book about how to have hard conversations that we thought was so critical to share with our community. And your book is so critical because here we are in a digital community. And I know that you know, this issue is so first and foremost for so many of our Janes. Um, and so who are some of the women leading, you know, leading this charge for a better internet, for a better news culture, for a better tech world that we should be listening to and throwing our weight behind or women who are inspiring you or that you came across in your research who are doing really fascinating work? Um, well, Ellen Powell has a research uh, and advisory. Yeah, I know, right? She's amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, she's in San Francisco Bay Area. MIT is doing an incredible amount of work uh, in, in this area and every aspect of computing, uh, you know, for example, the racism that's implicit in a lot of uh, facial recognition and sensor technology. Um, they just didn't design for anything better than that. Uh, so, yeah, um, my friend... Ideating, <laughs> What's that? You were ideating that uh, yeah. that facial recognition technology. Yeah, yeah, but it, yeah, that it just uh, crazy. Um, the the uh, director of the MIT Media Lab is Dava Newman. She's actually, I think, she might be. Anyway, her specialty is in aerospace. And uh, she has some other background in biology. She's an amazing person. And she's really taking on uh, women's inclusion and race inclusion and everything that the Media Lab is doing. She's one of my heroes. Uh, my friend, Michelle Ferrier, is uh, the entrepreneur behind Trollbusters. And she's involved in a lot of um, uh, entrepreneurship, media entrepreneurship initiatives for people of color and young people of color. She's just awesome. Um, there is a, uh, there's also a, like a think tank at the University of Virginia about race. And those people know everything about media. Um, definitely speaking my language or I'm speaking theirs. Um, you know, one thing I, I, I'm a little disappointed that um, that more women in politics don't really see this. You know, they don't want to fix comments; they just think it's a lost cause. And I don't, I don't know, uh, I don't know if they're wrong. You know, newspapers are really shrinking. You know, so um, I, it's less important. Newspapers are probably less important as a civic conversation. But really, as we build new forums and institutions build conversation environments for their own members, that's where I think 
we can really start out better and create the spaces where people will be involved. Totally. And um, I would love, like, uh, if you could shine a little light on Troll Busters right now, because I loved reading about them in this book. Uh, and it kind of reminded me on the flip side of Heart Mob, which is, you know, this like community of people who show up when someone is being harassed on the internet, almost as a form of bystander intervention uh, for the digital age. And so, yeah, I loved what Troll Busters was. Well, that's a, that's a lot of the intervention that Trollbusters does. I really can't speak too much about Trollbusters, but I would encourage you to in, invite Michelle to come and talk. She's just amazing. And, um, and again, she has had to change her profession. She's a former journalist who went into scholarship because she got harassed and was getting uh, you know death threats. She had to leave her community. And it was because she was writing about family life for a newspaper. <laughs> So, uh, you know, and, and not only was it because she was writing about family life, but her employer didn't protect her. That's, yeah. that's the real difference is, you know, it's one thing to have an antagonist. You know, many of us will have an antagonist, but the second thing is, are we tolerating it? And we all know from the, uh, for example, from the Donald Trump experience that someone can seem just improbably antagonistic, but he wins, mm. you know, and he doesn't win with the majority, but he wins over, you know, he was in the White House for four years and, you know, no one really liked him in the beginning, you know, it was, you know, even the Republicans thought that his candidacy was preposterous. Right. But, but he won using some cunning new strategies. Uh, but the point is, if you don't have the enforcement mechanisms for something that's good for all people, you're never going to, you're never going to create a civil culture. Never. Right. Just as an aside, I also love calling it the Donald Trump experience because then it feels like it's something that like I I was like given a wristband to get in and I wanted to get out and it just wasn't possible to exit the experience, like being stuck in the immersive Britney Spears exhibit in the zone. Um, and so I, love, I think I'm just going to call the the presidency that the Donald Trump experience. Uh, and, you know, something, too, that I that I found so interesting was that you you talk in this book a lot about, you know, that because of things like gender gaps and and sort of the gender hierarchies that are still embedded in journalism largely, that it it challenges, you know, journalism challenges institutions, but not necessarily the sexism inside of the institutions. And I think obviously the same can be said for for racism, for ableism, for ageism, that you know, if if the people doing that work are in a lopsided power structure, they're not gonna necessarily have this resources they need to challenge those larger power structures. And, and yet, I mean, I think a lot about the failures of journalism, in particular, interestingly enough, uh, when it comes to 2016, you know, this idea of that it's become clear to me that this idea that journalism is neutral and has no opinion, um, and that we have to present two sides of an argument, even when there's an objective truth, like, I think that those things often are rooted in, you know, patriarchy and benefiting the patriarchy. But you also say that you have hope, right? That news, that news, that journalism, that the media can foster inclusion, despite all of the data that you present um, about the ways in which it's unknowingly or knowingly fueling uh, these divisions. And so I'm curious, like, what, what gives you that hope? Well, there are a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, we know that the internet has given voice to antagonists, right? But the internet has also, so the internet aggregates antagonism and hate, but it also aggregates uh, women and it aggregates people of color and people have much easier ways to connect with each other and that so, so we have a critical mass. People who need, who want more representation can develop critical mass and say, oh, this is a problem that we need to address. I mean, I don't think we could have had Me Too without social media. Um, 
Or for example, if you remember uh, Shitty Men in Media. <laughs> oh my um, God, the Shitty Men in Media list. That was, it feels like that was forever ago. Yes, I do remember. Uh, that could not happen without the internet. And as a result, you know, a bunch of antagonists lost their careers. You know, um, it didn't, wasn't justice, but uh, so I, there, there can be critical, so the internet helps create critical mass. And that's one of the reasons why I think we're seeing much more inclusion, uh, people of color in all kinds of media, including, and I include that in terms of uh, entertainment media um, and news media. The second thing is, now that we have uh, data analytics tools, a lot of people in the, on the business side in news have said, oh, oh, we can do a better job reporting things that are of interest to women and people of color. Maybe those people could be in our audience too. Novel no idea. <laughs> uh, I know, right? Crazy. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing, I really think in the last few years, uh, childcare being covered as a public policy issue that it is. Uh, sexual harassment, sexual assault, um, Black Lives Matter, all those, uh, all those issues create a critical mass where some issues are getting resolved. That's why I have hope because, um, I don't know, I still, you know, my faith in democracy is wavering, but uh, in the United States it's wavering. But, I, you know, people- Well, they don't, don't say that to me. <laughs> when people get together, it's powerful. And I believe in that. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, this is one of the questions that we like to ask at Jane of all of our speakers. Um, it's one of my favorites, which is, you know, that I'm sure that for you, it's like what you must see uh, coming into the comment field, I'm sure, shakes your faith in, in this democracy. And, you know, obviously, sometimes speaking up about this stuff, being in that in that activist advocacy zone, you know, it can sometimes be very painful and hard to, to care about these things, to do this work. And so, you know, as you, as you strive to interrupt and disrupt these oppressive systems, what do you believe, you know, that you've gained? What joy have you claimed in, uh, in staking this, you know, this fight for the internet that you didn't realize you'd lost? What joy? Yeah, like what joy have you gotten out of the process of, you know, <laughs> digging through these depressing pieces of evidence that uh, that women have been silenced for millennia? Oh, that's a hard question to answer. Um, jeepers, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I feel, you know, what I guess what I do take joy in, my daughter could answer this question, is that people understand it. Mm. And uh, a lot of women understand implicitly what I'm talking about. And they're really happy that someone's out there really bringing it all together. And uh, sounds like I'm really pleased, uh, Carmen, that you talked about how I sort of gathered all this research and it's really true. So I, you know, I really drew on eight or 10 different professions. And I'll tell you one other thing that's a real joy. Um, so I wrote this book for the MIT Press and when you write a book for uh, on a university press, they send out a draft to all the experts in the to experts in all of the fields, and ask them for feedback before it goes to press. So, like, and I don't know who they are. They were blind reviewers. So they sent this book, the entire manuscript, out to six, eight, ten of the smartest people in their fields, and they told me areas that needed to be beefed up. I mean, really, that's just, that's just great, you know, uh, and the people the, there were, there was, there were a couple of crabby reviewers, but they didn't, they either didn't get or didn't accept right. inclusions in the book, and I can deal with that. I love it. Very writerly answer to say that the joy was the feedback. I love it. <laughs> well, well, no, I mean, the joy was having, having that insight before the book came out. I mean, really, totally. oh, okay. yeah, like, the smartest people in the world are going to read my book and, and decide whether it's worthy or not. I mean, it's not like I enjoyed the, the process of waiting for that, but um, having it before it went to press, that is a beautiful thing. 
Yes, and definitely like relate to that idea that the joy comes from realizing like, oh, I'm not the only one who is seeing this. And, you know, I'm not like a glorious side. I'm always said, like, we're not crazy. We all just weren't talking about it out loud and we thought we were alone. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, you know, writing the book. It made me feel so much less alone and less crazy too. I just dropped the link in the chat. Everyone should buy the book. It is incredible. And you get to support an independent academic press, Anne-Marie. Um, and thank you, you know, to our Janes who are here. Um, I also want to thank the J the future Janes and prospective Janes who are with us today. Um, it's the last chance to grab your tickets for New Year New Jane. I am dropping a link in the chat. You have to check your daily for a discount code for more conversations like these tomorrow. Um, to any potential Janes, please remember that you can use NYNJ50 for half off your first month at Jane as a thank you for coming to New Year New Jane and for being here with us today. Um, thank you. Oh, I'm also gonna drop a post event survey. If you loved this event, feel free to click this link and fill this survey out. Um, and so, yeah, thank you so much. Janes, non-Janes, Marie, Simone, thank you so much for all being here with us today. And thank you, Marie, for writing thank this. Thank you so it's much, incredible. Carmen. Thank you, Janes. And have a good one. See everyone soon. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.